Surgical Automation, Dr. Sanket Chahan. Great, thank you so much. I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, uh, you can put it great. in display. Okay, good. Great, great. So my name is Sanket Chahan. I'm a physician. My background is robotic urology. We are the founder and CEO of, of Surgical Automation. We are developing automated endoscopic robots, whether it's for upper GI, lower GI, cystoscopy, bronchoscopy, ureteroscopy, hysteroscopy. If there's a tube in a body and a scope goes in it, we can robotically automate that. And the other part of that is that we have, a, we have heavily invested in this IoT infrastructure. So these are all connected devices and it enables us what we call giving us integrated stakeholder experience. So for example, when a patient has to get a colonoscopy schedule, they go to their physician's office, they get these paper instructions when they are leaving, they come back home the day before the procedure, invariably they have questions, they try to call the physician's office, they can't find anyone, go to Dr. Google and they find out that they're dying tomorrow. Uh, so basically, you know, over-education and under-education, both, both is a problem from a patient as a stakeholder. From physicians, these are complex procedures. You have a scope in one hand. You have the other, other tip on the other hand. You're trying to go inside and navigate looking at the screen. Takes a long time to learn. Then we have to go to our office, pick up the phone, and do these dictations. Now, hospital administration has the biggest problem with robotics. Uh, these are capital-intensive equipment, these are underutilized. The only way to get revenue out of that is for your physicians to do more of these cases using the robot and uh, that cause all sorts of safety and quality issues. So our core technology is what we call um, uh, AI-based intraluminal navigation. You know, the robots can be of different sizes and shapes. Um, for example, a colonoscopy robot may have a longer length than a bronchoscopy robot, may have a larger diameter. Uh, than a cystoscopy robot. Now, this robot is attached to the stand. It is navigated inside, in this case, the stomach starts scanning for normal anatomical pathologies. In this case, it finds an ulcer. The robot recommends to take a, take a biopsy, and the biopsy forceps is attached next to the robot. It advances automatically. It's going to give a trajectory, which is always modifiable by the physician. And once the physician okays it, it goes and takes the biopsy. This is all automated procedure. And the user interface in here is a wireless tablet. So you're sitting on a chair with this wireless tablet. The only movement you're doing is swiping. So the case of colonoscopy looks for splenic flexure of the colon on uh, other normal anatomical landmarks uh, that we are as physician trained to do. In this case, it finds a polyp. And again, the robot recommends to take the polyp out. Uh, the, Snares are attached next to the robot. It advances automatically. It gives the trajectory of where it's going to take um, the bite. And once the physician okays it, it goes and takes that bite. The other indications can be in form of uh, let's see, in form of um, for cystoscopy and bronchoscopy. Again, you know the robot is attached to the stand. It advances using the user interface. Uh, the wireless tablet inside the urinary bladder, it starts scanning, looks for normal anatomical landmarks. In this case, it finds a lesion. Again, the robot recommends to take a biopsy. Biopsy forces is attached next to the robot. It advances. It will give a trajectory of where it's going to take a bite. Once the physician okays it, it's going to go and take that bite. Again, the user interface in all these, it's a wireless tablet. Once this is at the, once the scope is inserted inside the body, that's it. Then you come and sit on the chair, and you can use this wireless interface, uh, which is like uh, like a tablet to navigate. In this case, it uh, it's navigated inside the kidney, finds a stone. Robot recommends to break the stone. Laser fiber is inserted next to the robot. It gives the trajectory of where it's going to shoot. You can change the settings on your um, wireless notebook and once they are okay with it uh, you know the you shoot and this is this is how the stone starts get 
getting uh, breaking. You know, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the other, but please go to our website, auto search out better, go to youtube.com, look for surgical automations, and there are some more things available. So, like I said, these are all connected devices. We have a six different security layers and the actionable data warehouse. And it helps us providing these value-added services to all of our stakeholders. And what do I mean by that? So let's say the same patient who had to um, go to a, get a colonoscopy performed, instead of getting those paper instructions, they are getting this ac access to this app. Now this app has all the features, for example, what to expect, FAQ, checklist-based preparation, explaining each and every step, what does it mean? It even has a family interface. Now, from a physician perspective, the most important thing is these are automated. User interface is a wireless tablet. Imagine operating on someone using your iPad. That's the user interface of that. Next day, now, instead of uh, going and dictating, now they can go to their desktop, they can log into their own profile, and then they already have an OR notes available because the robot knows what it has done. It is editable. Once they add it, once they OK it, they press the send button, it goes and connects to the EHR. So it's EHR compatible. And then our business model is called robot as a service. So instead of selling these to the hospitals for X amount of dollars, we go and say that keep it. And our cogs are really low, so we can do that. And then we charge per procedure, of course. Uh, you know, there are minimum procedures and all that we can do. So this is the fundamental impact that we're going to have. For any procedure to be performed, specialized skills are needed. And um, these are the specialized skills that are needed. And now using our robot, because we have transferred the skills to the robot, this curve can move to the left so that the same procedure can be performed by lesser skills. So what does it mean? It means that, so for example, every man and woman above 50 years of age needs to have a colonoscopy schedule, so screening procedure. And uh, they're not enough GI doctors to do that. What if using this robot, internal medicine physicians can do that? Or GI physicians can supervise three or four PAs to do this and can come in when intervention is needed. So that's the fundamental impact of moving of this procedure. So I'm not going to go into too much details, but you know, how do we eat an elephant? You know, we had a lot of these options. We had to start somewhere. We did an objective measurement uh, of, uh, and we scored it on different criteria, things like sourcing data, automation, you know, market size, FDS, blah, so and so. And incubation, endotracheal intubation was a clear winner. So we did our initial seed round because an oversubscribed seed round. We developed the very initial prototype. This was last year. Um, and this is the entire robot. There is the whole robotic mechanism is in time. I'm going to go on the user interface in the next slide. But you see, this is a proprietary blade, and that's a tracheal simulator. Um, the way it works, you press this track start button, that's where the robot starts working. Again, press the insert button and it starts going inside. If it goes close to the wall, give it a second and it will recenter itself. And then there is this automatic braking thing. So, you know, if, if it goes too far, it will give you a warning to stop. If you don't stop, it will stop for you. Now, in this case, we saw that the, the, um, that the, the opening was really evident. In the, all of these cases, their openings are not that evident. And just give you an example, in all these cases, um, you know, we press the click start button and it sort of starts centering itself one click and then other click, you know, you do it starts inserting. So we have five PCTs. Um, we have seven different jurisdictions. We have six disused trademarks. Now these are these are the reimbursement rate. You see, the more interventional the procedure is, the more is the reimbursement. The more diagnostic is, the lesser is the reimbursement. U.S. TAM annual is nine billion a year. It is led by colonoscopy, followed by upper GI, and then we are doing a six million raise. Um, and uh, this is going to take us through the FDA of uh, the endotracheal intubation. Forty-two percent of this would be on developing new prototypes. And 14% of that is going to go in the FDA preparation. So, traction wise, uh, we closed our oversubscribed seed round last year. Uh, we have direct feedback from strategics. These include Medtronic, JNJ, Intuitive, Olympus, Pentex, um, Carl Stores, 
Stryker, Boston Scientific. We have direct feedback. We even have future meetings scheduled with them. We won the first prize in Reese Innovation Challenge. We have an alpha prototype available and over 1,000 LinkedIn followers. We are expecting term sheets for Series A soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. And we'll have beta prototype uh, by the end of this year and FDA free sub uh, meetings coming up. So I'm a physician by training of the Department of Defense Fellow at uh, uh, Florida Hospital and University of Minnesota. I did my fellowship. Rita Ambala, she's a Berkeley trained intellectual property attorney. She's a serial entrepreneur, a third startup. She likes to be involved for the first few years and then does some other stuff. Jason, he's a Harvard trained intellectual property litigation attorney. He's managing all the intellectual property portfolio for this. Aditya, Aditya is one of our contractors. He's going to be our first hire. He is a senior. He is a senior scientist at NASA at AIM Research. I'm his company, his company is doing all the AI work. For him. This is the last slide. This is our um, our advisory board. Gillian Schmidt, president of American College of ER Physicians. Rip Patel, founder of SRS. Amit Vora, senior entrepreneur. And you know, and then those are these are all who's who of this world. So that's all I have. Be happy to answer more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, let's start with uh, Doreen. Yeah, thank you so much. I remember the times with the Da Vinci, so I'm always impressed with um, technology like this. Have you done any outcome measure comparison um, for the patient? Yeah, no, we are we are way too early to go in the patient. You know, we have an early prototype. You know, we are still we still haven't done any patient studies with this. Um, we have started with the with the intubation robot. Our next step is with the colonoscopy robot and the upper GI robot, and also we are we are little far away from that um, from any human human study. And then I'm always curious. So, what will it cost for the patient then uh, at the end? You said um, uh, robots as a service, so that means yeah. like you as a physician providing the expertise and um, you performing the service on the patient. Right, right. So this is our our customer is still the hospital system, uh, just like it is for Olympus and all Olympus. And, you know, it's still a capital expense for the hospital. But instead of going and say that, you know, this is half a million dollar robot, we say that we're going to charge per procedure. That per procedure cost is based on number one, our uh, costs, which are pretty low. Number two, the reimbursement rates for every procedure. Um, you know, and I think I have I shown a slide for those reimbursement rates. And then number three, the numbers for us to break even. So th that's a complex algorithm that we have. Uh, again, it's a work in process, but uh, it's not going to be anything different for the patient. And it's actually going to be easier for the hospital because now they are paying for what they do instead of half a million dollar equipment lying there somewhere that they are not using. And then one last question is about... Um the process itself. So right now our surgeons have to be in the room with the patient uh, with the Da Vinci to perform the procedure. The idea actually was to use it on a combat field that the surgeon can be somewhere else in the world and right. then we can use a Da Vinci in the combat field. That's right. now not the case. So would you be able to do that utilizing specialists all over the world to do procedures um, away from the locale? So our vision is that the physician is still going to be around. You know, the capability-wise, this, this capability of remote surgery has existed 20 years back. You know, in 2001, the first telerobotic surgery was performed. It was performed on 9-9-2001, which was two days before 9-11. Never got the amount of, uh, you know, press as much as it would have just because of 9-11. But that, that technology has existed for more than 20 years. We are not trying to change that. We are not trying to do that. Do we have the capability? Yes. We actually, our initial uh, verification was done. We are based in Dallas, Texas. Our users were in Seattle and it was done online. So we have the capability. Do we want to take that to FDA now? You know, it's, uh, it, there's a lot of issues in there. And I think at this time, we, we're not gonna go that route. Thank you. Okay, uh, Wins. Yes, so you brought up uh, very good points about the user interface design. 
And in your team slide, I was wondering who is actually the force behind in your company who is designing this interactive and intuitive designs? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the, the user interface design, first of all, me being a physician is uh, very helpful because I'm one of the users of one of a lot of these things. You know, eventually, you know, it, it's, a, it's a function of funding as well. Eventually, we'll have to do those usability studies, get the data, make some changes. But from my perspective, you know, I can come out of my office, I can make a phone call with my colleagues uh, and uh, get that simple data in a matter of seconds, uh, which the right way to do that is actually do a study and, and get that, which we will have to do eventually. Uh, but that user interface device, I think the key part is that we are building the usability of consumer electronics, believe it or not. The most common movement right now that the young generation does is swiping, left, right, top, down. That is true, there's data behind that. And we are bringing that amount of usability to med tech in robotics because this is, and then, you know, we are, we are able to do that. So who's doing that right now, we are doing it. We are a small team, but as we get more funding, we, in our next month, we have a user experience person budget that will be doing all of these things. So my basic question was, who is currently doing it? Right now, I, me, me and my team, uh, you know, me and the CTO candidate that we sure we have contractors um, that we are using. And then, um, you know, we have, we have one employee as well that, that has done some mechanical design for us. With the, from the medical community, what's the initial feedback you get? Uh, well, the feedback has been great. You know, we have, uh, we have great, I mean, I, I think that even if you look at the other, other most advanced robotics, they, they, they're, they're wired, they don't have a wireless user interface. Uh, and it is not, it is still even the best one have these joystick kind of things. You still have the master slave relationship, technically speaking. We don't have a master slave relationship with automation. So this is not a master slave robot, which is a giant leap from every other robot that you see right there. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dana? Uh, I'm curious if from a regulation perspective, yes. um, <laughs> Do you have any concerns or limitation? And the one that comes to mind, I mean, I'm sure there's the technical complexity to it, but also from a payer yeah. perspective, when you're cutting back on the provider time in the room, uh, there is a complication of how you get paid for that as well. So could you speak to that from a technical? Yeah, so, 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 so the, the two aspects of this question as well, I, as I understood, one is the FDA pathway, number two is, potential reduction in time and all. So, so we are using existing reimbursement models. Uh, now, once we sit with FDA, there is a chance that it will get a breakthrough device designation and we can sit with PMS, have our own code. Great to happen. Our strategy right now is to use existing models, uh, existing reimbursement models. So, you know, we're gonna use that now. The second part of that question is about FDA and the pathways and all. And, you know, I, I believe, we believe this is going to be a 510K pathway. Um, we won't be surprised if FDA comes and says that, okay, we want to see the data and query patients and all. That's one of the things we actually included uh, in our incubation, um, you know, when we decided which one to start with and all. Um, from my perspective as a physician, as a parent, I have two beautiful daughters, you know, my standard is that will I let these robots be anywhere close to my daughters? And that's the standard. The pathway is the pathway. FDA has pathways, you know, for everything. So, so if if we can use it that way, if it is good for our patients, you know, FDA we will. FDA has pathways. It's, some may take more money, some may take less money, but they're pathways. But someone has to take the first step, and I, we are hoping it's us. Thank you. Thank you.